Arizona Springtime, Memoir of a Journey. It is and was written originally as a book, and I am presenting it this way as a video book. It's best to start from the start, Chapter 1. You'll find that under uh, my channel, Seldom Seen Southwest. Subscribe to it and you'll be able to find access to all the different chapters. Now we begin with Part 4, Grand Canyon, Part 1, Memory. This is Chapter 14, A Life-Changing Hike into the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is located on the opposite side of Arizona from our residence. The canyon dominated the far north of the state, and we reside in the far south tucked into the Sky Islands. Yet, the Grand Canyon has had and continues to have a profound influence on my life. It has had a profound influence on many lives. Artists, authors, photographers, and scientists have attempted to express the influence through their creativity. From a creative standpoint, the Grand Canyon is difficult to portray. Authors who have visited the canyon have struggled to describe aspects of it in descriptive essays. William Hamilton Nelson described the dilemma this way, quote, Ever since I saw the Grand Canyon in the spring of 1913, I have been trying to write about it. I always put it off because I felt I was not in the proper condition physically, mentally, and spiritually to do it justice. For a subject so stupendous, it takes spiritual insight and inspiration. Lots of it. End quote. James Fisher, co-author of Wild America, recounted his first moments at the Grand Canyon. Uh, Roger Torrey Peterson and he, he and uh, Fisher had stopped for a view of the canyon along the south rim at Desert View Point. Other cars were parked there, and some pines obscured the view of the canyon. As they walked to the point, Fisher began talking to his close friend, Peterson, about Sir Edmund Hillary's successful climb to the summit of Mount Everest, the news having been broadcast just that morning. After Peterson advised Fisher that they were only a few yards away from the canyon, Fisher recounted the moment they exited the pines that had obscured the view. The talk about Hillary ended, and he became mute. For Fisher, the edge of the canyon became the end of the world, and toward the horizon, eight miles away, the world began again. The chasm that lay between was undiluted awe. The friends remained mute as they contemplated the scene. A self-published book, Alluring Arizona, released in 1927, written by William Hamilton Nelson. The book is uh, the only published work by that author. Yet, he exemplifies the difficulty in putting a natural world uh, wonder into words. Nelson insisted that the canyon was simply the greatest thing in the world. Quote, the seven wonders of the ancient world were, compared to the canyon, little antiques, mere play pretties. We rave about these things, and we go into raptures over the sculpture of Phidias, Praxiteles, and Michelangelo. But these were mere neophytes and bunglers compared to nature. The Temple of Diana pales in significance beside the sculptured greatness of the Temple of Isis. Temples, battleships, cathedral spires are, all rear themselves grandly in the most wonderful spot on earth. The Hopi Indians say that the Grand Canyon is an entrance to their heaven, and all we can say is that they have a wonderful sense of location." End quote. Springtime is my favorite season to experience the canyon. The weather is volatile and the light and shadows are often momentary. The changes either on or under a rim move along at a pace suggesting a sitar riff by a Ravi Shankar as the end of a raga approaches. Writing specifically about spring is a surprising rarity in the accounts about the canyon. It is the canyon that is written about, and the seasons are usually but not always secondary. Anne Swinger meditated upon a, a late spring wind that came through the canyon one evening along the river. It was a warm wind a foretaste of summer's heat. It swept through the willows, and the raw energy shook the leaves, like a gambler riffling a deck of cards. Then she described the old spirits of the river that 
haunt their canyon, and the accompanying unsettling noises heard throughout the night. In the morning, a breath of wind became a breeze that ladles in the morning sunshine. Edward Abbey wrote about his first trip into the canyon. While he was still in college at the University of New Mexico, he joined his friends for a road trip further west. The group stopped along the south rim, and while viewing the canyon, Abbey saw an abandoned tire and famously pushed it over the rim. His details of that stunt are a little questionable, but he does admit that a nearby ranger mentioned an area of the canyon named Havasu or Havasupai, so the wayward bunch traveled to the trailhead. While his friends waited at the trailhead, Abbey ventured in for an eight-mile hike that led to the village of Supai on the Havasupai Reservation. During that experiential trip, Abbey transformed from a self-described Appalachian hillbilly into a desert rat. In the canyon, he settled at an abandoned mining camp. Along with exploration around the old camp, waterfalls, and pools, he also became acquainted with a few of the Native Americans. He even participated in a couple of yearly tribal events. At the end of his trip, he became trapped in a natural pool that he learned was deeper than he expected. To further his problem, the pool was surrounded completely with slick rock. After believing he would die there, he found an escape route. And then, just as he was to proclaim himself saved, along came a torrential downpour. He became soaked and hunted for a dry spot. He settled into a former den of a coyote where he spent one of the happiest nights of my life. When he returned to the trailhead after a five-week sojourn, Abby discovered that his friends had abandoned him. Joseph Woodcrutch devoted the entire first chapter of his book, Grand Canyon, for his attempt to explain how solitude can be experienced at Grand Canyon. First, he recalled his inaugural visit to the canyon. Upon arriving at the rim, he observed a fellow tourist who, upon his initial sight of the canyon, turned around and ran to the nearest tree. The man threw his arms around it and would not let go, no matter how hard his companions tried to pry him loose. Crutch tried to assure the reader that spending time at the canyon will unravel the initial surreal view. He believed that after a few days, one begins to lose the sense of unreality. The visual scale, which was impossible to grasp, would later begin to be understood by the mind. After his first visit to the canyon in the 1930s, Crutch returned several times. He believed that an experience at the canyon would feed anyone's imagination, but the canyon itself can with time reveal the story of the canyon to all those who will listen. For all the crowds, Crutch knew that the canyon offered a level of sublime solitude for each individual witness. Although his book was written in the late 1950s, before the large crowds of tourists that now flock to the canyon, his interpretation can still give hope to those that want to meditate upon the canyon. There is a connection between the authors who have written about the canyon and the geologic miracle that they visited. It is a transformation over a period of time I find so unfathomable that appreciation of the events that formed it can only be limited by human imagination. The canyon is amid the 130,000 square mile Colorado Plateau. The plateau is made up of ancient sedimentary rock that have been uplifted over miles skyward. The Colorado River has eroded the uplift for the past six million years. A variety of streams flow into the Colorado River from or near the rims. Those streams that flow down from the higher elevation of the North Rim have caused that rim to recede faster and farther away from the river than the south. Geologists count 21 sediment rock layers stacked in the canyon. The bottom eight formations are the most ancient, and the ancient sediment layers were crushed and tilted on their sides by tremendous geologic forces. The original environments that contributed to the making of the layers include oceans and seas, as well as musty swamps and the occasional desert. Some of the most ancient of the rocks include dark, metamorphic Visnu schist. Found at the bottom of the canyon, these rocks metamorphized, that is, transformed about 1.7 billion years ago. The rocks are an ancient volcanic igneous rock that was crushed and transformed within the heart of a massive extinct mountain range. Intrepid canyon walker Colin Fletcher 
attempted to describe some of the difficulties the writer faced as he tried to connect his words and the reality of the geology as he trekked the canyon. In one chapter, he described in detail his contemplation upon the dust that had lain down the sandstone 200 million years ago. He admitted to himself that he could not visualize such a thing, and he eventually realized that the number of years meant nothing. Later in his walk, he lay down beside Butcher Creek and imagined the many or organisms that use the creek. He imagined the burrow and the insects. He reasoned that, depending upon the lifespan of an animal or insect, the creek may appear to be virtually changeless. He believed in the case of humans, if the creek was familiar, they may witness the entire creek ecosystem change after a devastating flood. He sat along the creek and studied a blue-gray rock and concluded the toad must see the rock as everlasting. A moment later, he extrapolated that he and other humans have only a sense of brief period of time. Near him was a single 10-foot high rock that was perched near the stream, and he recognized the shape as that of a toadstool. Yet his view of the rock was wrong, and instead of a familiar shape, the rock represented proof of the blasting power of sand blown along the ground over an extended geological time period. At the very end of his sojourn through the canyon, Fletcher had envisioned that he would spend the last few days in quiet contemplation before re-engaging humankind, but that did not happen. Instead, he began to think about all the types of knowledge he had gained through contemplation on observations as his journey unfolded. During the final moments of the journey, he remained still and seated and knew he viewed the world much more differently than before. His journey in the canyon led him to the key to contentment. I always renew my excitement for the canyon by reading the wealth of books in the guise of guides, memoirs, pioneer accounts, explorer reminiscences, nature essays, and scientific studies. My understanding of the personal experiences of the canyon is aided on multiple levels by reading. Here is my account of the canyon and the most life-changing hike I would ever complete. I first got to know my wife Audrey in the spring of 1984 while seated along the rushing waters of the Colorado River in the deep inner gorge of the Grand Canyon. We were both attending Arizona State University in the spring of 1984 and were otherwise unacquainted. She was working toward completing her master's degree in marketing and I was finishing my work for a bachelor's in psychology. Audrey discovered that the university had an outing club from an announcement in the university newspaper. Exploration had always been within her spirit, and the club was a perfect match for her introduction to the natural history of the desert southwest. She contacted, contacted the club to sign up. From a list of upcoming events, she chose to participate in a trip to the exotic-sounding Rocky Point, Mexico during spring break. Tara, a friend of hers with access to a car, also joined the trip. On the day of departure, the participants took hours to assemble. One member opted to ride his motorcycle the entire way rather than carpool. The ride was going to be a long one through some of the hottest parts of the Sonoran Desert. The other four trip members rode in their friend's borrowed compact car. The trippers eventually arrived at the border crossing of Gringo Pass. They drove across the border and purchased mandatory Mexican car insurance. They took a breather from the cramped conditions of the car to load up on snacks in preparation for the long dusty road ahead, ending at the beach destination by the Sea of Cortez. Ready to load into the car, Tara discovered that she had locked the keys in the car. A young man from the United States had just crossed the border and agreed to give it a try. He quickly broke into the car through the sunroof using a handy can of grease. They thanked the anonymous Sam Samaritan and were free to continue. After countless miles along a dusty and rutted road, they arrived at the beach after dark. Dehydration had overcome all the travelers, and there were no shops open to quench their thirst. Today, the town has become a resort town, with camping on the beach considered lowbrow and frowned upon. During her trip, Rocky Point had seedy dives and flop houses, so the best place to stay was to camp on the beach. Her inaugural trip into Mexico was a good introduction into the vagaries of the outing club. 
Although the outing club ran loosely, one thing that was consistent was the weekly announcement in the university newspaper for a monthly general meeting. I read the notice for an outing club meeting in the newspaper while sitting down for lunch at the school union. The announcement of the club sparked my interest. I was drawn to the club since I was interested in learning about the wide variety of outdoor explorations I wanted to experience in Arizona. Before discovery of the club, I had relied on the few books covering in-depth hikes, trails, or general information about areas in the state. The meeting was held in a large auditorium that seated about 500 students. 100 people showed up for the general meeting. I sat towards the front and watched slideshows slide shows presented by trip leaders and participants of the recent outing club trips. The first slideshow was memorable because the skydiving trip at a mid-state facility ended abruptly after one person broke his leg as he landed. Slides show the hapless victim, victim being carried to a pickup truck to be transported to the nearest hospital. This was not the kind of experience I was looking for. Subsequent slideshows and stories from those trips were focused on trips into wildernesses. As the meeting ended, upcoming trips were announced, including another skydiving trip and a trip to the Grand Canyon. At the front of the auditorium, there were rows of tables with sign-up sheets for upcoming trips. The meeting ended with the president of the club asking attendees to join the outing club for adding their name to the sign-up sheets. The hike into the Grand Canyon offered only 10 open slots. From guidebooks I knew that a permit for an overnight backpacking trip into the Grand Canyon required several months' notice. The unexpected opportunity was exactly the type of nature experience I wanted. I wasted no time in paying the $5 fee to join the club and walked over and found that the sheet for the canyon trip still had many spots open. Audrey signed in just before I did, and I remember the moment because I thought, good, there is another person on the list. In preparation of the upcoming hike, I purchased a backpack at the Hiking Shack, popular local outfitter. I also bought a pup tent that was completely worthless, only used once, and an adequate sleeping bag used on many hikes. The trip scheduled during a weekend meant I had to find someone to click at the camera and photo processing store I worked at since I was the only person scheduled for the weekend. My trustworthy replacement was my friend Tim, who offered to fill in. He was sympathetic to the situation because he was an outdoors enthusiast and refreshingly amenable. Friday, I had not heard anything from the club and assumed that the trip was canceled due to a lack of interest or too few people had that signed up. I packed the trunk of my compact car before uh, as a hopeful gesture, gesture, then drove the 40 minutes to the university and attended Friday morning classes and later drove to work. During the shift, I anticipated a call at any time that the hike was still a go, but the shift came and went without a call. I closed the store as usual and drove the half hour drive north to my parents' house. There, my mother told me she had just answered the phone and someone left a message. I was to meet at the B parking lot at the university at 6 p.m. It was 5.30 that I received the message. I jumped into my car and drove to the university. As I pulled into the parking lot, I surveyed the expansive lot. At first glance, there appeared to be no one. Was I too late? I had no idea how it would proceed. I did spot someone along the driveway at a building next to the lot. Audrey sat on a ledge that was an architectural detail on the side of a building. On the ground next to her was a backpack. I guess this was the supposed meeting place for the trip to the Grand Canyon. I rolled down my window and she affirmed that was the meeting place. Audrey told me that Bruce, the nominal leader, leader of the trip, was gone, rounding up the others. I asked how we were supposed to get to the canyon. She said that enough people had signed up that two cars were needed. Bruce arrived at the lot, but just barely. His car was too rough to drive to the canyon and back. I was enlisted to travel with him to pick up a member for the trip at one of the nearby dorms. Once back at the B lot, the other fellow hikers had arrived and we all gathered for a brief meeting. I volunteered the use of my car. I had a handy bag of Doritos for the three hour drive to the canyon. Just 45 minutes late, the hikers divided between the two cars. Bruce and Audrey were in my car, the other five in a bright red vintage Ford Thunderbird. It was sunset as we left the parking lot. The drive north on the interstate was smooth. No poor weather had slowed us down. Audrey sat in the back seat and wore a polo shirt and denim skirt. 
She explained she had arrived in January to attend the university from her home on the East Coast. She had understood that the canyon was warm at the bottom, so she had packed a skirt and a pair of shorts. We arrived in Flagstaff about 9 p.m. and parked at the historic Weatherford Hotel. It had a lengthy carved wooden bar with a full-length mirror and a back bar. Although the taco-flavored Doritos had got us to Flagstaff, we ordered some late-night pizzas and inhaled them upon arrival. A couple of us made our way to the bar. Since I was driving, I ordered a Diet Coke. Everyone else enjoyed a beer. After the well-deserved stop, we proceeded to the Grand Canyon. Along the dark highway, we left the city limits and encountered spots of snow along the margins of the highway. Farther to the side of the road, at the fringes of the glow from headlights, the snow appeared to be only a couple of inches deep. But the longer I drove, the higher the drifts. Just outside the canyon, a myriad of deer were seen among the snow-covered evergreens in the glow of the high-beam headlights. I drove up to the pay booth for the Grand Canyon, but it had closed by 10.30 p.m. We found our way to the assigned campsite and quickly unpacked. Most of us had already spent a day at school and work. The primitive campsite was blanketed in snow several inches deep. The temperature was below freezing and a light breeze blowing off the canyon rim made it feel colder. Audrey and I laid out our sleeping bags near the picnic table under a snow-covered pine. There was no campfire, no singing, no camaraderie. It was approaching midnight. We all had a hike scheduled to begin just after sunrise. I wore a pair of jeans and shirt, then put on a second shirt. Inside of the sleeping bag, I never got warm, but I remember that I zipped up the bag to allow for only a small hole to breathe. Daggers of cold air pierced the opening through the night. Even though I was exhausted, I only drifted in and out of consciousness and never settled into a deep sleep. This ends part one. It will be continued with the hike into the canyon for part two. See you then.